nicer to hear. It means the same thing, so positively about Ireland's role in the world. And I wish to goodness they could get all their colleagues out and start preaching that message. Because we've been listening to so many uh, people bemoaning and wailing and you know at the end is not it. So Minister, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you indeed. Former, former deputy and uh, minister. Thanks. In the front here. In the very front. My name is Ronan McGovern, I work in AIB. Just, I'm wondering, do you think, I felt during the, during the last few years that the Irish people, we tend to blame the Europeans an awful lot for things that we kind of, for a lot of mistakes we made ourselves. I'm wondering, do you think that the Europeans feel that we've actually changed our mindset and that we now are beginning to take more ownership of the, the problems that we created ourselves? Michael? Yeah, as well as, first of all, we always think that the rest of the world, when they have their breakfast in the morning, uh, cross the table to their wives and say, like, uh, I wonder how they're getting on in Ireland, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so most of the time the Europeans don't even think of us. We don't cross their minds at all, you know? Uh, but, and it's, 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 how will I put it to you now? It's like this. I watch Bloomberg a lot. And very often, international investors and international commentators and politicians form a view of a country by the one line that goes across on the ticker tip. You know, Greek set the default, sets it for the day. That's that's the energy you carry with you. You know, so we have to be super careful in what we say, because it's the it's the era of the sound bite, and the image of Ireland is established by a series of sound bites, frequently on the financial channels. So to be aware of that, you can you can work into that then to to reset the reputation of Ireland by making sure that all the messages that are going out internationally are very positive. So we're sticking to our program and we're going to stick to it. We're going to pay our way, we're not going to default or restructure. We have a growing economy again, we're going to grow our way out of this. We've restructured the banks and they don't require extra capital. They're beginning to access money in the wholesale market again. Their deposits are coming in again. Yeah, you know, it's it's job, it's 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 export-led growth, and we're balance of payment services. And they're all only one-liners, you know, but but they all get into uh, into the financial markets, and that's what creates the the different image of Ireland. And uh, we keep putting out the positive message, and positivity leads to positivity, you know. Because the missing ingredient in the domestic market in Ireland at the minute is confidence. Like if we could build confidence in the domestic economy in Ireland, we'd be in a very good place very, very quickly. So that, that's what I'd say. Thank you very much, Robert, for that question. Now, the next question or <coughs> comments, and we're Lorcan Blake, over in the room. Thomas. Thanks, uh, Chairman. Minister, the financial markets are challenging democracy across the world, not alone in Europe. And I suppose it's true to say we have a democratic crisis. What steps do you think are needed to counter um, this challenge from the financial markets? Uh, the firewall we speak about is a defence mechanism in Europe, but this issue is a much wider issue. We see it hitting the States as well as Europe, and it's not going away. And as a democracy and as a democratic people, we have to stand up and ask ourselves, how is it going to be addressed going forward, long term? Thank you, Lord. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question to, to answer, because certainly the markets have a, a very strong influence at present, and they're forcing decisions on democratically elected leaders, which they might not take. But rather than seeing some kind of you know, conspiracy at work. I think we should look at the situation in countries as well. The, the markets are kind of mindless, you know. There's nobody kind of directing it. And the markets react. They're like a, some kind of force that reacts to the data that they have. And if they see risk, they'll avoid it. And if they see profit, they'll go towards it. I mean, Richie Ryan used to say when he was in my job, that there's nothing as funky as money. And <laughs> it'll run from risk always, you know. 
And a lot of what's happening in the market and what the, the kind of conflict between democratic leadership and the market is, I think, um, leadership not acknowledging uh, that the manner in which they've organized their countries is not, is not correct and adjustments have to be made. Now, the adjustments are being made very rapidly. I mean, you see the situation in Ireland with the banking disaster and uh, the government, uh, previous government moved very quickly uh, to put in a new uh, governor and a new regulator yeah. and to, again, merge the roles of regulator and central bank in the one institution uh, with a proper hierarchy and they you know, have staffed it up very much. So regulatory regimes are very, very important. You know, uh, The markets were right about the recapitalization of the banks. I mean, the, the, the stress testing that was done across Europe in June was a very good stress testing. But the line was drawn too low in terms of tier one capital ratios. And it was ridiculous to think that the markets would. And, you know, Ireland had a very good insight into this because we, we, we recapitalized the 10.5% uh, core tier one capital in the end of July mm. on American-based stress tests. And the Europeans were saying everything will be grand if we recapitalize at 5%, 5.5%. I mean, it, was, it, it couldn't stand up. I mean, I argued the case with them in Europe. I said, you're wrong, you'll be coming back to this again. And they're recapitalizing now at, at uh, core tier one at 9% plus mark to market. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really saying is that the markets need to be controlled by more regulation. But we have to acknowledge as well that very often the markets are really reacting uh, to flaws in the economies of individual democratic states. And it's up to the democratic leadership to fix those laws and not just to blame the markets. Okay. I think that the might I think that's Dennis Corbett, am I right? Um, I think while we were meeting our Prime Minister was talking, there was quite a mention development in Athens that's read from my blackberry. Um Captain Braille has offered to resign and um, there are talks uh, and allegedly in the report going on to form a national government and the Prime Minister being spoken about is the chairman of the Greek National, the, the Greek Central Bank. Yeah. I think this might mean we probably don't have to face a Greek referendum. Of course, you don't know everything is speculation, but it looks as if um, Greece might be sorting itself out. Thank you, Dennis. Also, well, that's, also, uh, McMahon. that's very good news, uh, Dennis. You know, and I mean, it, it confirms democracies will sort themselves out. There are similar talks in Italy. I don't know how it's going to play out, but the best rumours from Italy are that they're going to form a national government, principally of technocrats, and former Commissioner Mario Monti is going to be asked to be the Prime Minister. But, I mean, I can't vouch for that. Might, that might be just high-class rumour that, that, that I'm getting on the phone. <laughs> okay. Very last question, I think, coming up. Park Murphy here. Uh, yes? Uh, Paul Murphy, a member of the Institute. Minister, one of the things that has been talked about in connection with this crisis is that eventually we will have uh, a proposal to amend the treaties uh, in the direction of greater integration. Uh, what do you think uh, is the likelihood of this and what is the Irish view on it? Thank you, Paul. The position is that President Van Rompuy has been asked uh, to look at what needs to be done to implement the agreements made uh, at the heads meeting recently and to report back uh, to the heads meeting in December uh, on the possibility of whether treaty change uh, would be required or not, among other things. Now, uh, one of the things in the communique which concerned us was that uh, they want to, the, the authorities in Europe want to enshrine the Stability and Growth Pact in law. Uh, and they wanted to do it by way of referendum, where you'd have a constitutional break on, on having deficits that are too high. They pulled back from that. So in the communique they said uh, a legal break, preferably, preferably in the Constitution. So we'll be able to meet that recommendation under law. Uh, the Irish position on a referendum is uh, we don't think we'd get it through at present, but if it was a, a referendum which enhanced our position and it wasn't a simplicity or change in the treaty, then uh, you know we would uh, we, we'd look at it and we'd examine it. 
Uh, we can't be seen to kind of stand in the way of progress across Europe. But uh, I don't think, from what I hear, there'll be any proposal to change the treaty for four or five years. Uh, the Lisbon Treaty, from the first time it became a matter of conversation, took seven years before it was actually implemented. So there's a long lead-in time in Europe for a lot of these things. So I don't think we're going to be faced with an immediate treaty change. But the Irish government position is uh, we think that 95% of what needs to be done can be done within the present treaty framework. Uh, but we're prepared to examine any proposal uh, to change the treaty. And we won't you know, rule it out simpliciter. But we're, we're putting down the marker that we'd have great difficulty in getting any European treaty through a referendum in Ireland at present. Thank you.